Hey, it's Mike. Thanks for tuning back in. Uh, I thought I'd get out a quick video today, and I know I said I was going to get the Evan Mathis video out, but I have this research for this other video that also involves Evan Mathis. So I'm going to lead into the Evan Mathis trimming scandal at some point in the near future, maybe next week, maybe later this week. I don't know. But uh, this one is about the 1990 Tops Frank Thomas No Name on Front error card, which is probably the most valuable error card of all time, one of the most sought after error cards of all time. Before I get to that though, some quick channel updates. Uh, today is Wednesday, probably won't do a video tomorrow, but I have a Hobby Think Tank video coming out where Danny and I discuss the 500 Home Run Club and whose cards are undervalued and overvalued. So that's a fun one. I hope you will go and watch that. That's over on Bench Clear Media. Friday, I'll do an Attic Find Friday. Of course, last week's is at 20,000 views, you guys. That is bonkers. Uh, I love it, obviously. So uh, I don't expect any others to ever get to 20,000. So we'll see. Um, and then Saturday, I'll put out another video. I might do the weekly news video Saturday instead of on Sunday this week because Sunday I'm going to the Shriners card show with Oliver in Wilmington, Massachusetts. Very excited about that. Um, and uh, so that's it for this week. Let's jump right into 1990 Tops. No name on front, Frank Thomas. And these, this is really cool information. I'm going to give you the source of my data first. Uh, I found some good sources on cardlines.com. I also had a longtime subscriber and commenter, Ohio Lawyer F5, who emailed me some information that he got from various sources, including postwarcards.com, which is, I love postwarcards.com. They have awesome stuff. I go to them all the time. Postwarcards.com, prewarcards.com. I don't know if they're related, but uh, both are fantastic sources of information. And so I got a little bit from both of these sources and both of them gathered information from Collectors Forum, Collectors Universe, I think, forum from a post in like 2009. So uh, a lot of really good stuff here. Not much valuable in the junk box era. Basically the most valuable cards are usually error cards, interestingly. So depending on what you call the junk wax era, you know, you could go back to the, the 1982 Topps Blacklist, which I did a video on last week. Um, so is that, is that an error? I guess it kind of is. Um, and then this Frank Thomas, you've got the Dale Murphy reverse negative. You've got the Billy Ripken F face error. They, uh, there are a lot of them. They're all over the place in the 80s and 90s. And in fact, a lot of people felt that in 1990, Topps was trying to capitalize on the 1989 error popularity by producing this rare Frank Thomas. And that, that actually doesn't really hold up um, for various reasons. And postwarcards.com goes into a lot of detail of this, which is all common sense, I think. But uh, obviously in 1989, you had the da that Dale Murphy reverse negative in upper deck. You had the, um, uh, the Billy Ripken card that I already mentioned. And those drew a lot of interest to the hobby. And some people felt like Topps did this on purpose. Like experts believe upper deck did the Ben McDonald no team logo error on purpose. And that's, that's a belief, but this Topps Frank Thomas couldn't have been for various reasons. One of them is that Frank Thomas wasn't a top prospect. I don't even think he was a top 50 prospect. Uh, so there wasn't any demand for his cards really at that time. Um, there weren't enough produced to really create huge demand in 1990. There are f believed to be fewer than 400 in existence. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for Topps to to do this error. You know, you would expect there to be a lot more of them available, not mass produced, but a lot more than 400 for the for it to really increase demand. So cardlines.com does a really good job of assessing the other possible explanations for this. And I'm just gonna highlight them and I, I encourage you to go over to cardlines.com. I'll put a link to both of these articles in the description if I remember. But uh, Cardlines explains why it can't be a damaged black printing plate. They do a nice job of that. I'm not going to go into that detail. They also assess why it can't be a dirty black printing plate. Uh, both are interesting explanations and very helpful. But the generally accepted 
theory here is that uh, the sheet, the sheet of cards became dirty, dirty during printing. And what happened was the, um, they would stop print run every 1,000 sheets to do quality control. And so every 1,000 sheets, you're going to produce a thousand, you could produce a thousand sheets with an error on it. You could do more than that, of course, if, if it's not caught in the, after that stop. But the, um, at some point, the print run required cleaning, uh, and the press man, pressman, pressman, used a cleaning solution but didn't wipe it away from the machine, preventing the black ink from sticking to the sheet. So you have to imagine that the, well, I, I don't even really know how to describe it really, except that the, the cleaning solution just blocked the black ink from hitting the, uh, the sheet. And, and they did a, cardlines.com, actually I think collectors initially did this. They did a really nice job of showing the sheet of cards and how this solution stretched out. I'm gonna put it right up here right now. And you can see all the cards it's affected. Uh, it's such good work by them. Uh, obviously, none of the other cards really have much value. I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about those cards. But the Frank Thomas is right there on here. And uh, in some cases, maybe in another sheet before it got caught, there's a partial blacklist. I'm not going to cover the partial blacklist either because that's also of very little to no value as an error card. But the no name on front, it's completely blocked. The name is blocked. The ink didn't hit the card at all. And in fact, um, we'll go into some counterfeit examples and show what's counterfeit and what's not and how to tell the difference. Actually, let's just do that right now. So an authentic, authentic uh, no name on front has a small black dot in the name on the box, and I'm going to show this uh, on the left. So the authentic one is on the left, the fake one is on the right. So authentic has a small black dot in the name box, so a slight amount got through there. There's no Tops logo on the authentic one because that was black and didn't get through. The authentic one lacks the black border around the name box but the counterfeits tend to have the black border. Uh, the authentics also lack the black border around the yellow border, the, the black lines around the yellow border. So BGS actually slabbed a, an, a, a fake one at some point quite a while ago. And so that's, it's, you can get them through for sure. You wanna make sure if you're buying these, you know how to tell authentic from fake authentic from counterfeit, or you're buying it slabbed. And these are expensive. We'll get to that in a few minutes. In 2012, Dimitri Young, who has an amazing card and has his own pedigree in a PSA, on PSA slab labels, Dimitri Young sold his, for charity, it was a PSA 10, sold it for $24,000 to, you guessed it, Evan Mathis. Evan Mathis then changed the label. He had PSA change the label to say no name on front instead of the Dimitri, Dimitri Young collection. Then he sold it in 2022 for $170,000 for about a 600% return. Not too shabby. You know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Evan Mathis pretty soon. But uh, yeah, 170 grand, 600% return in 10 years. The population on this, the name on front has 20,000 graded by PSA. 17% of them are PSA 10. The no name on front has had 237 graded by PSA. 0.4% are PSA 10s. So pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, that, that one is the D Dimitri Young one that went to Evan Mathis who then sold it. So that one sold last year for $170,000. It's, it's a, the only one as of right now. There could be more out there, of course. There, uh, I mentioned earlier the partial blacklist. There are 22 of them in the population. It's just a slight, missing slight amount of black ink in the name box. 22 of those in the PSA population. There are seven full no name on front that are autographed. I couldn't find any prices on those. If you see those, let me know in comments. 
Actually, I want to see. I want to know in comments. Have you have you seen this card at card shows? Do you own one? Do you want one? I want this. This would be a an amazing card to have in my collection. It's uh, like kind of a, a centerpiece for people my age. The interesting thing is that this this card didn't even matter until about 1993 after Frank Thomas won his MVP. Beckett didn't recognize it as an error card until that time, 1993. So this is another part of that argument of why Topps probably didn't do this on purpose. Um, so sales on this, PSA 4, just sold last month for $5,000. So you got to pony up quite a bit of money just for a PSA 4 on this. Five grand. Uh, PSA 8 in December sold for $8,000, which was down from $11,000 in May of last year. So just seven months, and it dropped about 35% in value. Uh, the name on front 10, the normal 10, sells for between $50 and $70. So very, very common card. I am trying to get the autographed version of the name on front. Obviously, I love the no name on front autographed. But uh, I have the Frank Thomas rookie card autographed here in a PSA slab. That's the score card. I want the tops one. So the partial blacklist one, PSA 8, just sold in November for $500. A 9 sold for $1,400. But that 9 also sold 10 months earlier for $9,000. Dropped about 75% of its value at that time. Probably overpriced when you think about it. Uh, to find these, you can you find videos all over YouTube of people searching boxes and packs for No Name on Front Frank Thomas card. These were believed to only come in boxes and cases of hobby or retail grocery wax on the East Coast. So whatever sold at that time, if you know of a, an old uh, junk wax card dealer, they might have it. Uh, I couldn't find anything that showed, like in the 1989 Fleer, people know what the um, code on the box has to be for it to be a F-face error. I couldn't find any evidence of that. If you know of anything like that with the tops, no name on front, let me know in the comments. But that's that. Um, if you're new here, I do nearly daily sports card content, interesting stories, fun stuff like this. All right. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good day.